All right, so we are back. Yes, I have a tan line in my head. That's because I played golf today and wore my glasses because I'm blind as a bat. But one thing I can see is this Jake Paul Mike Perry matchup coming down the line July 20th, Emily Arena. Your boy's going to be there. And we've talked about this fight a little bit at this point. We've talked about how Mike Perry and Jake are great entertainers. How this is a, a interesting pick for Jake because it's a risky move before you fight Mike Tyson to fight Mike Perry. Based on what can happen with this fight and how Mike is dangerous. He is violent. He is wild. He is unpredictable. And he is undefeated as a bare knuckle boxer. And no, that doesn't mean he's the greatest boxer of all time. But that's what we're here to do today. We talked about the entertainment side and all that. I want to get into the X's and O's. I want to talk about about the jimmies and joes the ebbs and flows gives you that energy that tickle your nose okay let me that's not i'm not promoting that never mind anyway what i want to talk about is what mike perry is continually hinting at and actually at this point just saying is his plan for jake paul and why i think it's very very risky plays right into what jake's strengths are but also mike's strength and could win him the fight but also may get him knocked out cold. But don't just take it from me. Mike had some things to say. Then we'll go into the film study. Mike Perry versus Jake Paul. Is his plan to beat Jake the right one? The breakdown. Let's go. All right, so here is Mike Perry on his podcast, Overdogs. And the name of the episode is literally Mike Perry Explains His Plan versus Jake Paul. They are literally and figuratively and metaphorically not pulling any punches with this Jake Paul fight. We are... As it sits right now, I think less than a month away. So we're not getting the full eight to 10 week camp. You got to get right into it. So let's see what Mike has to say about how he's going to beat Jake. I, I told on Helwani, I was like, you know, his team has been lying to him and protecting him from certain things. And this is a, this is going to be a wake up call and a realization. And I got nothing to lose here. I just got to go out there and fight like I want to and like I know how and give him everything I got. And I'm not playing it like it's a game. I'm not underestimating the kid. I plan to be punched in my face and it hurt. But I plan to take that shit and hit him back harder. Okay, so... A lot there. There's a couple things I want to take away. The mental side of this. One, he he brings up the Helwani interview and says, listen, I went into that saying what I believe, which is Mike thinks that Jake's team protects him. I assume he's talking about the sparring that happened years ago that Mike was in with Jake and the fact that, again, Mike said they were supposed to go eight rounds because Jake had an eight round fight coming up with Tyron Woodley. I think that was around the same time period. Could be wrong. But in Mike's words, they cut it off early because they saw what was about to happen to Jake and that Mike was turning up the heat and putting the pressure on him and it wasn't the same as the first couple of rounds where Jake was landing punches. That is something I think he holds on to from that time period. I don't know that that's the same now. Like That was his fifth fight, but still, level of competition-wise, that was a massive jump. So Jake was still learning the sport. It wasn't something where he was as experienced as he is now, so you couldn't really throw him in there with killers and expect him to knock everyone out, right? You had to have that nice blend of trash cans that he could beat up Guys that could push him and guys that could work him but would not go as far as they could. I don't know if that same formula is at that same level now. Where Mike thinks, oh, they were protecting him. They've lied to him about where his level is and I'm going to teach him. You hear Mike say that a lot in this podcast. It's an hour long. We're not going to watch all of it. But he keeps saying, he's green. I'm going to teach him. While acknowledging that he's the one that's 0-1 as a boxer. I assume he means I'm going to teach him how to fight. Or I'm going to teach him how to go to deep water. All these things. But again... It's a risky game plan to do as Mike says here. And plan on getting punched in the face, but walk through it and still be in Jake's face till the later rounds. He's come out a couple times and said he, he wants this to be a war. He wants to get punched in his face. He smashed his non-existent nose cartilage against his own face to show it's, it's not there anymore. <laughs> I have to think that's for a multitude of reasons. What happened in their spar years ago, what he thinks Jake's relative level is right now, and what he does in bare knuckle. He does walk through a lot of punches and takes a lot of damage to get to his end result. We'll get to that in a second. All right, so here are the guys watching the spar that Mike had with Jake. Again, this was three, four years ago now. So uh, let's see how Mike looks back on this spar and what he actually takes away from it. Huh. That. And she's like, here oh, we okay. are, here we are like, watching it. Uh, but so Mike here in the red, Jake in the yellow. Uh, let's take a look. Mike, this looks like he's pressuring him. Jake's kind of moving around side to side on the ropes here. This, this is you and Jake here, what, three years ago, right? Yeah. yeah. You think I didn't see that camera? I said, I'm going to give Jake a compliment 
And we're, look at see, him breathing all heavy and shit. That's one of the number one things like I see in this fight. Like, bro, Jake tends to get tired. He's a big boy. Lactic acid builds up. You know, especially the bigger you get, too. I mean, I could see you guys worn it out and then you wearing him down. I mean, just like that clip show. Look, shows. I landed the last punch there. You saw it? I punched him in the shoulder one more time. <laughs> all right, so again, you, you can see it's pretty clear what Mike wants to do. He wants to tire Jake out. He called Jake fat in the Ariel Hawani back and forth. He will be the smaller guy. Jake is coming down in weight. I can confirm he was above 230 pounds at one point. But you heard his co-host say, I can see you guys having a war and Jake tiring you out. So it's clear Mike wants to be heavy pressure, take damage if he has to, and then just walk forward until Jake gets too tired from punching Mike in the face, I guess. Again, a super risky move that I think is risky for multiple reasons. One, yeah, it may work in bare knuckle where guys can only punch a certain amount before they either break their hands or one of those big power shots lands and faces get cut open, split up, or someone hits the canvas. It's not the same as the Marcus of Queensberry. You're talking about 10 ounce gloves on that protect those hands that allow for more volume of punching, but not only that, heavier punching. And Mike knows that, I, I know he does, but the difference is massive between those two things. And when you combine that with the fact that Yes, Mike has been able to take punches from guys. By the way, he's taking some punches from Luke Rockhold that were nasty left hands. Leo, you can throw those up. Straight left hands down the pipe, and Mike just ate that shit. But he was hurt by those punches in that Luke Rockhold fight. Not to mention the Eddie Alvarez fight, which we're going to do some film breakdown on. But the problem Mike is having here is that his full belief is he's going to walk through Jake Paul's power and I'm not so sure about that. And what I mean is, let's go back to the Luke Rockhold fight, the one I just talked about. While Mike Perry won that fight, and he did so by doing exactly what he wants to do to Jake Paul, pressuring a bigger fighter like Luke Rockhold, taking punches. Mind you, Luke Rockhold's southpaw, he was taking straight left hands down the pipe. And while some did hurt Mike, he was able to walk through him enough to land left hooks to the body and big overhand rights. One of his biggest weapons, one of the things he will go to in this Jake Paul fight, surely, is his hooks and his overhands. Mike does have a jab, but he doesn't necessarily rely on it very much. Even at range, more of a pawing jab, and he kind of just walks into range, straight up and down, posture, chin up in the air, squared shoulders, walking forward. It's a recipe for disaster if you're teaching boxing to anyone, because again, it's it, there's just, he's so easily hit, but it's like he does it on purpose. He is trying to tire you out defending punches with his face. I don't understand it, but it works, again, in bare knuckle. But again, it also gets him in big trouble. Like I said, the Luke Rockhold fight, he got clipped a couple of times there, was able to walk through it. But the real indicator, at least for me, was when he fought someone with some big time power in their hands that actually had some decent boxing in Eddie Alvarez. I had never seen Eddie purely box. Obviously, you know, in MMA, he had the wrestling background and, you know, he was the dog and was able to scrap with a lot of guys, which would, is what made him perfect for bare knuckle. But in this bare knuckle fight with Mike, he was showing some great boxing ability. Again, Mike Perry was able to take some nasty punches, but also the Alvarez is not as big or as experienced as a particular boxer as Jake Paul. And what I mean is go back to that fight. Watch Eddie Alvarez land a lethal left hook on Mike Perry in the exchanges and clip him on the chin. It was a punch Mike didn't see, which again, the ones you don't see hurt the most. And it had him stumbling for a good two or three seconds before Mike regained his composure and switched back into freaking Wolverine mode and kept walking forward. But throughout that fight, Mike was stifled for the most part early on with a jab. Eddie was able to jab Mike Perry over and over and over. It was like clockwork because Mike Perry doesn't move his head. It's on the center line. It's there to be hit. And again, Eddie was fine in the target. Jabs, double jabs, jabs right hands. And again, Mike, yes, was walking through all of it. Got wobbled by the left hook, one he didn't see. I think he saw kind of everything else. But the point I'm trying to make is these are diminishing returns for Mike Perry. Like, yes, you can take some of these shots. And he has been able to in fight after fight after fight until he can't, until he doesn't. One of those shots he doesn't see. Jake does have a pretty decent left hook, especially his pull left hook that he wants to throw as guys pressure him forward. These are things that are detrimental to Mike Perry having success unless he's able to take those punches or he, he shows some better head movement in this fight to get to the inside range where I think he can have success if he is in the pocket if he's in the phone booth I mean attached damn near to Jake 
and he can throw those hooks to the body then come upstairs with a nasty overhand, then yeah, Mike Perry's got some nasty power, knocked Luke Rockhold's tooth out of his mouth, broke Eddie Alvarez's orbital bone, knocked down MVP, has been brutalizing people since he stepped in bare knuckle. He's got big time power, and if he does get to range, he does get inside and land to the body upstairs, those things are gonna hurt. I don't care if Jake is 215 pounds on fight, whatever it is, it's gonna hurt. Like I said, you can look at the Luke Rockhold fight and watch him start smacking Luke Rockhold's head around like a freaking pinball. But again, it's that transitionary period, that in-between. How does Mike get to range? And also, this should be brought up as well. Once Mike gets to range, one of the things that's very prominent in bare knuckle is the tie clinch or the half tie clinch. The thing that we always here in Influencer Boxing look back at is the Logan Paul rule, right? The holding of the head and the uppercut behind it. It is something that, you know, sometimes happens in boxing exchanges, especially when people are throwing and their head is moving and you get too close and you miss the hook and the hook goes over the head and you just want to throw the uppercut after the hook, but you've hooked the head instead of punching with the hook. You've wrapped it around and the uppercut behind it. This is actually allowed in bare knuckle. In fact, it's 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 one of the big strategies of the clinch is to be able to work in there with the half tie and throw the uppercuts underneath or switch full Muay Thai plump, bang, and then switch again, bang, and you're just continuing to work over and over as you hold the back of the head. He cannot do that here. And that's been some of Mike's big success, especially on the inside where he holds the head, body punch, uppercut. That stuff is not gonna fly here. So how does he adjust to the rules of the Marcus Queensberry that's another major factor because if he's having trouble at range and he's just walking forward and then Jake decides to boom, throw that right hand over and maybe he misses it and they're in that clinch. Does Mike try to sneak and throw underneath or does he try to separate or does he go to the body? And if he does, Jake has been known to, if you want to exchange with him, he'll come upstairs and hit you with a hook you don't see, which is what wobbled Mike in the first place. You see where I'm going. Mike has to show more than we've seen him do, especially with his boxing technique. And this is what I'm talking about when I say Mike's technique leaves a lot to be desired as a, as a boxer at this level. Now, granted, I don't have the best boxing technique, and I'm not here to say that I do, but I know what I see when I see it. So before you get in the comments and say, Wade, you're no better, I know that. I know. I'm just saying for this fight, Mike is going to have to work on some things that I see with these baby blues, and I always tell you guys that I say, what I see. This is Mike on the mitts, and again, it is just mitt work, but I want you to look at posture here. I want you to look at punches thrown. When you watch this, the holes in Mike's game start to cement themselves, and you see why he fights the way he does. Let's take a look. Push again. Push again. Then higher. Push. Feel. Catch two. We need step two. Let me roll behind that. Touch. Rip off. Yeah. Touch. All right. Again, 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 one more. All right, so you see the full session there. The first thing that I think of when I watch this is he is so stiff and upright. I know that this is his, him getting burnt out on the mitts, but when I watch it, it's just there's no head movement at all in these combinations. Head off center line at the end or beginning, right? It's just ta 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 ta. And again, it's just it's a burnout session here, but. Mike's also super flat-footed, and there's no finish on these shots. They're damn near all arm punches, chin straight up in the air. And he goes, slip two? That's a nasty punch there. That's what I want to see. I want to see some slip two out of Mike. I don't see a lot in his fights, but look at this. Head off center? Huh? And then back with it? Huh? That is what I want to see. Look at the level change. Look at the weight distribution pushing off that back foot. Bah, down the middle. That's what we want to see. That creates power. That could leave Jake a little bit reachy with that jab. Boom, on the back counter. Right? That's that's the stuff you can get to manipulate Jake in the boxing ring. If Mike brings that, then okay. We got something here. I just haven't seen that in any of his bare knuckle fights. I've seen him walking forward, squared up, chin up, posture here, weight back, and throwing the punches. And you guys see his pad man catches the lead hand and Mike actually hits himself in the eye, closes his eye to throw the rest of the combination. That, if I mean, again, this is a sequence and he just happened to get hit with the pad there, but if you're catching that shot and you're hitting yourself in the eye and that next punch you don't see and a right hand comes over the top, that's good night Irene. So again, I, I think I would just rather see Mike move his head than try to catch punches because that means his chin is on the center line and it's not moving. So, yeah. There's that, man. Listen, I want to see Mike Perry do very well in this fight. I want to see 
this be a, 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 a dog fight. I want this to be a war, but I don't want it to be at the detriment of Mike Perry for him to go in wanting said war and actively giving Jake a reason to win it by saying, you're going to punch me in the face and I'm going to take all of those punches and you're going to tire out by hitting me in my face. It's a flip of the coin to say who's got the better pan speed, power, and durability versus who is a better boxer and who's going to be able to manipulate boxing distance situation clinches with the correct technique and ability to save energy and to be fresh late or to land explosive punches when the openings present themselves. Mike isn't looking to set up shots and create an opening off of his boxing. He's looking to create an opening off of his durability, off of his speed and power, but all of that just forward, forward, forward with no defense. Ugh. Like I said... It's a risk. And if he does show up like he's shown up in a lot of bare knuckle fights, I could see Mike Perry landing a big shot. I could see him rocking Jake, going body, 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 boom, left hook or overhand right, which again, I want you to watch out for. It's one of his best weapons. But let's say he sits down at the blackjack table and hits on a 16 and busts no ditty. That is where Jake Paul has the opening to knock Mike Perry out. He plays that game. He sits down at that blackjack table every single time that Mike Perry wants to exchange with Jake Paul. One of the things Mike Perry has said to Jake was when Jake told Mike he was an idiot for getting punched as many times as he does, he said, well, good thing fighting isn't a smart man sport or something like that. Good thing fighting isn't about being smart. And he's absolutely wrong. While bare knuckle boxing can be won by toughness, durability, and the will to keep going through just the most violent interactions you'll see in hand-to-hand -hand combat, boxing is called the sweet science for a reason. Yes, you have to be tough. Yes, you have to be durable. Yes, you have to have the heart of a champion. You have to have cardio, all of these things. You also have to be a thinker. You also have to be a technician, and you also have to have skill. We'll see if Mike Perry brings more of that than I'm seeing here, but as for his game plan to beat Jake Paul, all I can say is it's a massive gamble. It's a huge risk. And it could take him to the promised land. It could be the thing that we've never seen. Jake pushed to his absolute brink. Or it could get him knocked out cold. Exactly how Jake predicted. But that's where we'll leave it. We are uh, less than a month away. I'm sure we'll be getting more footage, more stuff coming out. Fight week. I'll be there in person to bring you guys even better content. But can't speak on too much of that right now. So... What happens with Jake Paul and Mike Perry get in the ring July 20th? I don't have those answers. But Mike Perry thinks he does. So, I guess we'll find out.